Okay, well, welcome everyone to this meeting of the virtual CICS user group. Um, I'm Trevor Eddles. I'm CEO of uh, uh, iTech Ed Limited. We're a mainframe consultancy analysis and technical authoring organization. Um, we're the people responsible for the content on the virtual kicks website and we produce the newsletters. Uh, if you haven't seen our website, it's uh, virtualcics.hostbridge.com. Um, let me start then by going through the agenda for this meeting. As usual, most of the meeting will be taken up with a presentation. And today our guest presenters are Joe Winchester, IBM Senior Technical Staff Member, and Jeffin Sibby, who's lead developer on the Zoe Explorer for IBM Kicks. Uh, they're going to be discussing how Zoe makes the mainframe open, simple, and familiar. And a copy of the slides from this presentation should be on the website later today, maybe tomorrow morning. And if you missed any of our previous meetings, you can download copies of those presentations from our website too. And you can listen again to the whole presentation. There's a link on the resources page on our website. So that's virtualcics.hostbridge.com forward slash resources.htm. Uh, following Joe and Jeffin's presentation and any questions you have for them, we'll move on to the latest Kicks news and the latest Kicks related articles. Feedback requests is there to remind me to ask you for your feedback about this virtual meeting. And then I'll give you the dates and times for the next couple of virtual meetings. So that's the plan for this meeting. I'm anticipating that it will last for nearly an hour, something like that. Anyway, as I just said, today's presentation is from Joe Winchester and Jeff in Sibby. Uh, Joe works at IBM on ZOS tooling, focusing on the Zoe project. And Jeffin is the lead developer on the Zoe Explorer for Kicks IBM, uh, sorry, for IBM Kicks, opening up the world of Kicks to Visual Studio Code users. So Joe and Jeffin, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. And what I'd like to do now is pass control of the meeting over to you. So uh, let me unmute you if I can. And Joe, I think, is going to speak first. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. So you can hear me? Yes, we can. Hear me well. Just... Hear me good, whatever. Now I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yeah. And you can see um, that I love Kicks logo. I can't see your screen yet, Joe. <laughs> OK. Yeah, then anyway, you're in good hands yes. for technical experts. We know yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> We know, we know how to click the button that says, do you really want to share? Um, awesome. OK, great. So yeah, let's get going. So I, I think what Jeff and I have got prepared today is kind of we're quite light on charts and we're going to mostly be doing kind of demos. And <clears throat> if and when uh, you think that we're trying to pull the wool over your eyes or we're not telling you the truth or not telling you what you want to hear or you have some more questions, um, I think you're muted, but please holler in the chat and we'll try and sort of uh, either answer those directly in the chat, whoever's presenting won't answer or else we'll sort of pick up and, and you can kind of steer where you want this presentation to go. Um, so to start with, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so the first thing I wanna say about Zoe is Zoe is not IBM. Zoe is not an IBM product. It is open source, 100% open source. Um, it's um, distributed under what's called an Eclipse Public License 2, EPL2. It's actually got nothing to do with the Eclipse Foundation. That's just a license. Um, it's owned and managed by the Linux Foundation. And I remember when Zoe first started, um, I've been at Zoe since the beginning. I don't know. We were probably thinking about Zoe back in 2017, 2018. Um, and um, when we first approached, looked for open source foundations. I always thought the Linux Foundation was just a bunch of people who created Linux. Um, they, they, they do create Linux. They are the kind of overlord and steward of Linux, but they also are um, own and manage Jenkins, for example, which I didn't know. Um, Node.js, um, I think they've got about 400 projects. Kubernetes, 
GraphQL. This is the, um, a, a fraction I've got here. So OpenAPI, which is what Swagger became, sort of mock of the testing framework. So what the Linux Foundation provides, Zoe, is it provides it, it's completely vendor neutral. Um, there's about nine um, mainframe software company vendors who have um, contributed and built around the Zoe technology. Um, so it's not owned by any one. Um, and they provide that kind of openness and fairness and um, democratization and governance. And also they provide lots of neat stuff as well to make sure that Zoe is kind of enterprise ready and it's secure. One of the things when I talk to customers about open source is they think, well, if I let open source, if I start using open source, then basically, um, you know, you've just kind of, you know, let people into your enterprise and it's not going to be secure and secrets are going to leak and blah, blah, blah. So the Linux Foundation is very aware of that. So, and, and I talk to customers as well and they say, well, I don't like, I'm not using open source. And, and you say, well, are you using Jenkins and Node and Java? And they say, yes, perhaps all three or two of the three. And then you say, well, then you're already using open source and you can kind of divert the conversation about what their worries really are. Okay, so um, let me just do a little bit of the next. Um, Zoe.org is where you can go to find out everything about Zoe, including how to download it. And um, it's a quite a sort of vibrant website. And it's got all the different components that are currently being built, or some components uh, that are currently in sort of incubation stage. And if I just try and pause that, I think I can pause it there. You can even see the number of downloads and things we've got. We've got a blog. Okay. So very quickly, I want to show this. Just we kind of a little bit of brag about this before we get to the end. Um, one of the things that we're quite surprised with by Zoe is quite how well it's been adopted by the mainframe customers. And this is a survey recently. It's an Arcati mainframe yearbook. And it said that it's a sort of independent survey of um, mainframe customers. And it said that, you know, these were last year, so this was 2021. And they said that 50% of sites making plans to make use of it in the coming year. So potentially by the end of 2022, um, you know, half of mainframe customers will be using Zoe. Uh, certainly it's already, um, you know, around the fifth, um, which is great. So if you look at thing about crossing the chasm, so it's really becoming a kind of um, a, a adopted technology. So now let's get into a little bit about it. So it fundamentally, it breaks into, when we first started building Zoe, I suppose what we wanted to do was we wanted to make a platform um, to the mainframe that was kind of open, open as an open source, um, simple and familiar with the two words that came out of a design camp that we had. By familiar, what we mean is we want to make it so that if you already know how to use something else that's not, wasn't built as a mainframe tool, but you already know how to use another IDE or a, another um, um, CICD tool like, you know, like Jenkins or another um, non-mainframe language perhaps, um, that you, that you found the mainframe familiar. So that fits into the kind of um, problem that some customers have, which is um, where, you know, experienced mainframers know how to drive ISPF, they know how to, um, you know, issue TSO commands and so forth. They know how to drive, um, you know, CMT and, you know, CEDA and perhaps Keki and CDF for kicks and all those C-star transactions. But the newer generation coming up might not. Um, and they might not even perhaps want to even work for the 3270 terminal. So, but they might be familiar with other, other tools um, um, like Jenkins or Bamboo or Travis for the CICD pipelines. And they might be familiar with VS Code and they might be familiar with just you know, driving a web browser and a GUI. So we need to make it so that from where they're already sitting, they can operate the mainframe. That was really one of our goals. Um, I sort of had this analogy. It's perhaps not a very good one, which is that if you want to learn how to be a really good cello player, it can take sort of 10 or 20 years to basically make what's effectively a wooden box with horsehair sound really beautiful. Um, but if you already know how to use, um, and to make lots of music, you need lots of musicians in an orchestra who, 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 who have spent sort of 10 or 20 years um, mastering their trade, mastering their craft with one conductor to make a really great sound. But if you know how to play a piano, um, which is where you hit a note and you kind of guarantee it's going to make the, the same sound back. Uh, you can get an electric keyboard and you can just hit a button and say, make it sound like a cello. And pretty much um, uh, it'll sound very similar to a cello. Um, 
electronically, right? You're bringing that experience to the person who already knows how to operate a keyboard. Um, rather than having to make them become a sort of expert cello player playing the actual instrument that it was designed. And anyway, maybe I should move on to another analogy. I'll get into demos. Here we are. So most of, most of the day, we're going to focus on the command line interface and the VS code. But if you want to, we can focus a little bit more on the Zoe desktop, and we have a component called the API mediation layer. OK, so fundamentally, the command line interface is really designed. It's one of the first things that we, 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 we built with Zoe, and I'm just going to switch to demo mode. And it's interesting because I remember the very first, I'm just going to start my terminal on my Mac. I'm just going to resize it. I remember when we first presented Zoe, I think it was back at a share um, conference. Some people got quite upset because they said, I've already got a command line interface in terms of TSO. Why do I want a command line interface to the mainframe? And other people got upset because they said, I expected something that was really flashy with lots of GUIs and bells and whistles, you know, and, you know, animated. Um, um, animated GIFs and so forth, and the command line interface is too basic. Both of those two are sort of true, but I'll try and explain what the difference is. This is my laptop, right? This is my MacBook. And I'm just going to, if I want to operate with Git, for example, which is a thoroughly modern DevOps tool, um, uh, you know, repository, I just I often, I just type the word Git, right? And Git tells me all the things I can do with Git. There is a graphical user interface for Git, but I don't use it, and I don't know many other people that do use it. And the same is true with Docker, or the same, even is true with AWS, right? Amazon Web Services and things. You tend to operate, and the same is even true with my laptop. If I want to see what directory I'm in, I type PWD for print working directory. If I want to change a directory, I do CD, right? Um, and um, let me just make a quick directory. Um, let me do a quick, um, we're on March 8th, aren't we? You know, CD Mar 8, right? So you typing in commands is kind of muscle memory. It's what most sort of IT people sort of do. So, um, and I'm just going to type the word Zoe. So I have the Zoe command line interface installed. Now the Zoe command, one of the nice things that you saw when I did my Git, um, Git command is it told me all of the available Git commands and the same is true with Zoe. So I've got installed a lot of plugins for Zoe um, from vendors. I'll talk about the base Zoe. Um, which is most of basically these commands down here. And then we'll talk about kicks as well. And then you can get extensions to Zoe for certain tools. So this is like, imagine you've got a mobile phone and you haven't got any apps from the app store yet. This is what you get in base Zoe. You get the ability to work with files. Uh, you get the ability to work with jobs. You get the ability to work with um, uh, Unix system services, um, TSO. Um, ZOSMF workflows, you can work with FTP and things like that. And then you can get extend, oh, and console, that comes in the base, and then you get various extensions. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to try and do is issue a very simple command. So now I saw jobs, and what's interesting about jobs is I can just type Zoe jobs, and it will then tell me everything I can do with jobs. And there's a list that I, you know, cancel job, delete, download. And if I do Zoe jobs list, as I type each command, it will tell me what's next um, list jobs. So I'm just going to do Zoe jobs list jobs, and I'm going to get some jobs back. And if I want to, I can just do Zoe jobs list jobs. Now here's where it gets interesting. I can just type grep, and I can just type grep four. So I'm piping it to grep, and I'm piping it to, and just typing four, and I'm going to get a list of all the jobs that have got the word four inside them, which is a smaller list. That's actually quite a large list. Um, so what you're able to do, the reason I haven't had to log on to the mainframe, this is actually issued a request uh, to go and get this data from the mainframe and then come back. Because I'm still on my laptop, I can kind of fuse it with all of the products I have available on my laptop as well. Because I haven't had to log on to TSO or log on to a 3270 terminal via Telnet, then I am able to stay in this world. And that's the advantage that you'll see when we go forward with Zoe. So the first thing I want to do quickly is just quickly show you a few sort of commands you can do. So I'm just going to go and do Zoe files list. Do some file stuff. So Zoe files, this is both um, Zoe files list DS for data sets. And that's my high level qualifier. And I can start typing in various commands I want to use. Zoe files list DS. By the way, if at any point in time you get stuck, you can do Zoe hyphen hyphen HW. That's a shortcut for help web. 
Oh, and it's just opened on my other monitor. So I'll just drag it into my primary monitor. And this is all of the available commands you've got. So for example, if you want to do a command, like I want to list, get all the members in a data set, and you're not exactly sure how, you can just type this and you can see, okay, I can do Zoe files, list all members. And you can see all of the attributes um, if you want to sort of change things to do with, um, uh, so I'm just going to do Zoe files list all members, a very quick one, yeah. And this is searchable, which is nice. It's just a different way. Sorry to um, let me double click that. Let me make that the right side. It's just another way to get all of the help. So I'm going to do Zoe files list am, and I've got a data set. I can see one at the top called JCL. Winsj dot JCL. And I'm going to get a member, and I've got a job. Let's go and have a look at that of JCL. Zoe files download. Copy job. Now, what I'm trying to show you here. Um, oh, I made a mistake. Okay, let's fix that one. Zoe files. Oh, I, I didn't do download DS. I didn't say whether I wanted to download from a data set or Unix system services. And I'm just going to cat that file now. So let's have a quick look at that file. So that file is going to copy from the data set. So you, we can see this is a very simple program. So this is a IEBGENER program, which is kind of like the hello world, one of the very first pieces of JCL. When I issue that job, it's going to copy that member called from to a member called March the 8th. So if I go Zoe jobs submit DS, I have to get a DS, right? Otherwise, I'm going to get because I can submit this from a data set or I can submit this from a um, copy job. It'll submit the job. And if I go back again later, just the members will see it. So I can submit jobs from that. There's my file that ran. So I was just driving the mainframe with a command. The next interesting thing I want to show you how to do is the Visual Studio Code, the Zoe Explorer. Now, the purpose of, if I go back to the presentation a little bit, uh, where is it? We have it here. Let me just go back to why, why is driving it from a command interesting? The reason it's driving from a command for interesting is because if I'm writing scripting on my laptop or scripting within a Jenkins pipeline or something like that, or some automation scripting, and this is actually a sort of real, real Zoe script. This is shell script, and you can see the command Zoe files list data set. This person is listing, but they're substituting in uh, Unix variables, right? And they're doing a sort of matches. And then what are they doing here? They're piping it. I just did a very simple pipe to grep, but they're using jQuery, which is a JavaScript library. They're looking, they're counting the number of rows, making sure they've got some data. They're creating a data set classic. Um, they are then submitting a job um, and they're piping in the actual JCL of the job that they've got. It's exactly the, the one that we were doing just now, the hello world. Um, submitting the job. Uh, again, they're using jQuery to get the job ID, making sure it's valid. So somebody who's valid in script can basically automate the mainframe, right? They don't have to be an experienced JCL developer or an experienced Rex developer or another mainframe language. And within Zoe itself, we provide sample scripts for how to use Zoe um, in a number of different languages. So we provide them for, this could be a PHP, it could be Ruby, it could be R, it could be Python, it really doesn't matter which, right? Anything that can just issue these commands can basically start chaining these commands together. And you can do some quite sophisticated mainframe, um, mainframe orchestration, okay? Um, I'm just gonna drop down out of here. The next thing I wanted to show you is the Visual Studio Code, because I'm we're going to be using that later. So Visual Studio Code is the sort of second real, really popular form factor for Zoe users. Um, if you have Visual Studio Code and you go into the extensions in the marketplace, you'll see the Zoe Explorer. So I have the Zoe Explorer loaded. Um, when you load the, the Zoe Explorer, you will get this additional kind of thingamajiggy here. Can't think of a better word for it. Um, the kicks one is loaded, so I might just quickly unload that because that's what Jeff is going to show later. Um, I don't want to. Um, so when I go back here, the kicks one should have disappeared. 
Um, so this is the same system that I was connected to just now. I can search for data sets. I can enter like sort of, that's my high level qualifier and I can see lots of things. I'll come back in a second. Um, if I go and look at my winchj.jcl, that was the same sort of data that I was querying there, right? But it just, and it's actually using the same, it's actually using the same underlying classes. Um, this is written in Node, and this is written in TypeScript. Notice TypeScript is just compiled. TypeScript. So you can see the four members I've got. Now I'll say the same scenario slightly e e easier with this. If I go and look at this here, um, I'm double clicking it and I'm able to sort of edit it. It's a much more interactive experience rather than it being the script, which is really designed for kind of a machine to, to drive. It's script and I've got this cop this job. I could do a much simpler one. I'll do March 8A, you know, I'll save that um, and I right mouse click it come on and do submit job it's going to submit the job right in place it gives me a little kind of do hickey down here in the bottom right hand corner so i can actually go and have a look at the job it's return code zero so it looks just fine i'll just refresh that one and then i can see the one that they copied uh, copied that data set called from um hello everyone today on march 8th um, other, some other interesting things, just on staying on the whole JCL submission, that's very popular for people doing automation. I'm just going to very quickly talk about JCL substitution variables. This is really popular with some customers that I talk to. So one of the things that they like to do for the modern, if you've got people writing lots of scripts, like doing, where, where, where was I? Let me go back to here. So I did Zoe job, submit job, but that JCL was fully, this JCL is, is fully baked, right? He's taking, he's copying that file to that file. That's not that interesting for automation, right? What's more interesting for automation is if I look at the next piece of JCL that I've got, um, this one here, is I've got the word source and target. So the name of the source and the name of the target are not specified. And I'll just try and show you what, what I'm what I'm going to do here. And I'll just talk to it very quickly. So what I'm going to do now is it, so let's assume I just submit that JCL and the one I created called copy palm. It's going to die. It's going to bore, right? It's a JCL error, okay? Because it's badly formed JCL. Uh, we can see that if we wanted to, uh, three, four, five, seven. But 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 we sort of know it's it's not going to work. Um, let me just try and find that job there. So that's me because I submitted it, isn't it? Oh, job prefix. Um, uh, oh, I can see, I called it Kix Palm, so I can call it Kix Palm, can't I? Um, yeah, here we are, it's JCL error, right? The JCL error, because it died, because it's just going to say, what are you talking about, right? Um, you know, I don't know where I'm copying from, and I'm copying to. But but what's cute about this, um, with the JCL, with the, so I'll do, I'll do it slightly again, and I, you can basically say dash dash JCL dash symbols, and then in quotes, you say, um, source equals, let me go back to my copy palm, um, source equals, um, I don't know what, from who equals, um, I don't know, rugby, I can't think of something, I'm just literally just, um, and what happens there is basically substitution will occur, and with a following win, uh, we should have, and the rugby one didn't work. Okay, so we're going to debug this live. What did it, what did I do wrong now? I must have made a mistake. Um, from got from I didn't I didn't substitute the target. I must have made a spelling mistake. Uh, I put two equals rugby. I didn't spell target. So. Okay. Okay, yeah, we, did, we saw the rugby data. Don't want to dwell too much on this, but this is very successful for customers doing automation. So what it means is I talked to some customers and they have somebody in their organization who's perhaps a little bit more experienced with JCL who starts to refactor JCL to parameterize it so that it makes itself easier to be driven by script. Another quick thing I just want to touch upon very quickly is that's very popular with this is Rex. I know a lot of customers who have a lot of Rex and I'm just going to um, lip in a simple Rex file it says hello all you lovely people today and we can issue um <clears throat> you can issue rex commands and get the output as well so i'll just do zoe tso 
issue command. And um, what you do is in here is you say exec, and then you type the name of your Rex member, which is winchj.rex.hello. So I hope you can see that. And maybe I'll make that a little bit higher up on the screen. Um, so that, what, that, what that bad boy is going to do, and I think I have to close the quotes off, um, is it's going to basically going to issue it, and we're basically going to get back uh, echoed. Um, it's, got, it's got all of the startup message. You can actually do something called dash dash SSM, which is shortcut for suppress startup messages. So you can issue Rex, and now, now you've got it back. You can pipe it to jQuery. You can use awk. You can use whatever commands you want to. Um, and again, similar with JCL, with JCL, you saw with substitution variables, we're able to pass variables in to do automation. I'll do a quick example of that as well. Um, this is another uh, piece of Rex, pass argument carp CMD. If, it's, if I pass in Zoe, it's going to say, hello, Zoe. If I pass in anything else, it's actually going to do the other thing that I pass in. So if we look at this, what's going to happen now is let's change it. So rather than issuing hello, we're going to issue in ENT interp, and we're going to pass in some arguments. And I think the arguments just go straight in here. So in single quote, so I'm going to pass in the word Zoe. That's the first argument. I could have passed in multiple arguments. That's the first argument. It's going to hit this Rex and it's going to go, oh, oh, you passed in Zoe. I'm just going to say hello, Zoe. So it should just say hello, Zoe back. I suppress the startup messages. And if I pass in another argument, and here's where it can get really wild. I can just say, well, time, it's actually going to interpret what I just passed in, which is the time. And you see the time, right? And you can do anything else, right? I could even do LU or something like that here. So what I'm just going to try and show you is that you can drive automation, pass in arguments, start to parameterize your Rex, start to parameterize your JCL, and you have this very nice kind of boundary layer between the two. Cool. OK, there's lots, lots more I could show you, but I'm going to try and kick over to Kix a little bit because, um, but you know, we have Unix system services. We can edit. Um, um, uh, actually, sorry, I haven't. I need to create a filter in this. Uh, some of my favorite things. I actually, so a lot of Zoe's developed in USS. I develop, uh, use this to develop Zoe. You can, you know, right mouse click, create directories. Uploading files is very cute. For anybody that's ever had to upload a file, you know, FFT, FTP or SFTP can be messy. It can be difficult and things like that. You know, you can just hit upload files and straight away you've got a nice prompter. So it's, it's actually quite nice for uploading files. If you download something like you download a PAX file or something you want to transfer to the mainframe, it, it actually does a very nice job. Just literally letting you do that sort of point and shoot upload. Um, the one, another quick thing I just wanted to quickly show you because uh, um, it was a sort of recent addition. Uh, it's more sort of for performance, but if I go and look at data set filtering, I can create a new filter and I can say user.proclib um, z star, right? So I can go into a PDS with a lot of members and just look for all the members that start with the word z, okay? So, so it's, it, it's, it's, getting, it's getting there with the sort of ISPF 3.4, ISPF 3.17, um, you know, there's, there's, um, it's, it's becoming, it's getting all those kind of cool features that you'd expect to be there. Cool. Now let's go and do some Kix command line interface. So, interestingly about Kix, let me just go straight to browsers. Um, so the command line interface that I showed you before, well, it, that's written in Node, and Node is extensible through what's called Node packages, Node package managers. And if I go to npm JS and type the word Zoe, you'll see that there are about, well, it's 55 packages with the word Zoe in them. Some of these are actually Zoe itself. Zoe distributes individual packages. And some of these are extensions for Zoe. And I'm just going to type, um, well, there's extensions for DB2. There's extensions for um, uh, CA Endeavor, IBM NetView, uh, Microfocus have an extension, Phoenix Software have an extension for EJs and stuff like that. The one I'm really going to uh, look at at the moment is Zoe Kix. So we can get an extension for Kix called Zoe Kix for, for Zoe CLI. And if you click this, it'll give you the instructions for how to download this. You can also, in zoe.org, if you look at the documentation, um, just click that link. Go on, be nice to me. Uh, we've got setup. Um, 
we've got something for um, installing Zoe command line interface and it even tells you how to install it and install the CLI. You don't have to install the command line interface, by the way, directly from npmjs.com. Some people don't trust that website um, for actually quite good reasons, but you can actually, um, you can install the command line interface from a local package. You can actually download and we distribute on zoe.org, we distribute a fully tested TGZ file that you can just grab and download. Um, and that's also available. Uh, some of the software companies who participate in Zoe also deliver that through their kind of you know trusted sources as well. So you don't have to grab all this from open source. Okay, but it also talks about kicks as well. It tells you how to install the kicks and the Zoe Explorer. Okay, here we are. So now I'm going to show you what the kicks does. It tells you a little bit about what it does here, but let's take it for a spin. Um, let's, so let's go back to our command line interface and try and drive this bad boy. Uh, Lay down everything I've written and make it a little bit bigger. So remember, I said I perhaps said at the start. So once I extend Zoe, I I end up with a series of plugins. By default, when you first install Zoe, you wouldn't have these plugins. But imagine that this is like you bump into somebody in the street and they've got a mobile phone and you have a look at it and they've got the base stuff it came with, you know, like the compass and the calculator and so forth, the ability to make phone calls as well even though that's kind of a minority sport on phones these days, uh, but they've got, uh, but I've got the plugins for kick. So that gives me the ability to issue that Zoe kicks command. And the Zoe kicks command gives me a, a quite a, de a decent set of functions um, for being able to work with kicks itself. These are driven around a CMCI connection. So for those of you that have the kicks Explorer, which is the um, Eclipse plugin, uh, you, that will already be enabled. Um, Either you can go to a Kixplex or you can just go to a standalone region as well. Um, the type, the things that I like to do, or the things that customers like to do as well, is I'll just do Zoe Kicks get resource. I'll show you how you can sort of do this thing. So I'm going to do Zoe Kicks get resource Kicks program, and that's going to go to the system that I've um, connected to and just give me all the programs. And there's a lot. I mean, I'm going to grab that scrub, but there's a lot. So often, what if you you can actually start then filtering that stuff. So you can say Zoe kicks resource get program dash dash criteria. And then you can say program equals, and I'm just going to do like, you know, LG star or something like that. And what that's doing is that's just getting me less programs back. Um, rather than th there's a lot of data in a program. So I can also say that what I want to do is I can say you can do RFF, which is short for response format field and I'm just going to get the new copy count status program I don't know change time you can basically start so what you can do is you can sort of chop and change the data <coughs> that you want to as well that's also all still available if you do Zoe help web and again it appeared in my browser my other window so about that so if I go and look at kicks if I look at all of my Zoe kicks commands I can see the see them all here so I can see I can do Zoe kicks get resource and it tells me down here, you know, how you can filter, um, how you can get the response, how you can get the header and so forth. So uh, what's quite nice as well is I can do change time. Um, I can do RFT table. I can skinny it to sort of turn it on its side and get everything presented. And this is actually really nice. So we can instantly see, okay, there's, I've got a, actually, I can't see that that's new copy count. So I think I, I can specify RFH response format headers. Put some headers on them so i can get you know and again because i can grab all of this this stuff is really really useful so if you just submitted a job from a pipeline and you want to go and have a check you want to go and see is this program enabled you can do some sophisticated automation here because you can reach into kex and get all of this information back up um you can start doing some i'm just going to pick up i feel like i'm on a cookery program here's one i prepared earlier um but what i'm doing here is i'm just saying not status enabled so i can see all of my disabled programs um i can see uh what's another one i can i'm not just stuck with um kicks program i can go to you know kicks files that's kicks local file you know so you can start seeing local files and in fact you can query basically any base table that you want to um there's no base table that you can't query every single base table is is surface and that's um and it's not just read only with the zoe command line interface uh, let me go back come on web browser where are you Let's come back, have a look back at all the syntax that we can do. It must be 
that one. I think that one. Yeah. Um, you know, we can add things to lists, add things to CSD groups. Uh, you know, we can define definitions. Um, you know, we can install them. Um, so that's quite sophisticated. That's quite nice if you want to start automating all of this stuff. So you don't have to go CEDA, you know, CMTI, and so on and so, so forth. Cool. I'm just going to pause there. And I think what I'm going to do next, Jeff, do you want to um, start sharing and take over? Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. That was awesome. I'll start sharing my screen. Cool. Yeah, and while you're getting set up as well, I mean, I didn't talk about DB2, but you can, for, for a lot of Kix customers have DB2, you can issue um, dynamic SQL, uh, you know, call stored procedures. Um, once you start chaining these together, um, these uh, commands, uh, you can do some really quite sophisticated orchestration. Cool, thanks, Joe. Um, hi everyone. So the Zoe Spore for IBM Kicks is a Visual Studio Code extension, and it builds on top of the Core Zoe Explorer extension that Joe showed previously, and it's built to allow interactions with um, Kicks resources all through VS Code. So just to give a brief background, we released the extension in August last year, and since then it's had. Um, well, today I checked it's had eight, seven, over 700 unique installs. Uh, so the project, the extensions gaining publicity really quick and it's being used uh, by a lot of users as well. So what problem does it actually solve? So the Zoe Explorer is, the core Zoe Explorer extension as Joe showed is a really powerful tool and it allows a Kix COBOL developer to perform several actions, such as opening a data set, editing a member, um, submitting a job, and uh, several other functions as well. But the only issue is that you can't perform Kix specific commands such as a new copy. And to perform a new copy, you would have to exit VS Code and switch to a terminal, so like a 3270 emulator. And that's something that we wanted to try and avoid. So we wanted to give the user uh, the ability to perform their, uh, I guess, Kix COBOL development entirely on VS Code. And that's, exact, and that's exactly where the Kix extension comes in. So it leverages the Zoe Explorer so you can perform all the core Zoe Explorer functions, but you also get the added ability to perform Kix specific commands such as a new copy. So the, um, so the point that I want you to bear in mind is that it allows a Kix COBOL developer to perform tasks entirely on Visual Studio Code from start to finish without having to switch views. So if I pause my presentation and switch to Visual Studio Code, uh, so as, jo as Joe mentioned before, you can search for Zoe in the extensions tab of uh, VS Code. And that basically searches the marketplace for the Zoe product. So we've got the Core Zoe Explorer extension here, and we also have the Zoe Explorer for IBM Kicks extension as well here. And installing it is really simple. You just click the install button. And since the Core Zoe Explorer extension is a dependency, uh, Visual Studio Code installs Zoe Explorer as well. And once you've got that installed, uh, again, as Josh said, you'll get the Zoe icon in the left sidebar. So once I click that, as you can see, along with the data sets, Unix system services, and jobs view of the Core Zoe Explorer, you also get a new Kix view as well. So when you first install it um, and expand the Kix view, your um, the view will be empty. And the first thing you probably want to do is create a new connection, a new CMCI connection. And to do that, you click the plus icon, and then you get a drop-down menu containing, well, containing the option to create a new profile. And you also get a list of uh, profiles that you previously created. But again, when you start, this will be empty and all you have is the create new kicks profile button. So if I click that, that opens up a nice web view for me. And I can specify the protocol and type in the host. So for example, when MVS3B, um, there's a port number, 
user details, and also optional details as well. So in the option details, I can specify a region name or system group for the connection. So essentially that's the scope. And I can also specify a Plex name as well, or I can leave these two blank when creating the profile. And once I click create new profile, that, um, that creates a new profile icon under the Kicks view, and then you'll be able to um, manage resources in that particular connection. So if we expand 3B here, which is a connection to WinMVS 3B, um, you can see the uh, regions, regions tree under, underneath, and this is the region IY3B and CAF of that particular um, connection. Just before I go into these trees, one other thing that I wanted to show you is the ability to edit connection details of a profile. So you can right click a profile and you got the option, option to update profile. And what that essentially does is it opens up a similar web, similar uh, web form and it, and it also, also fills all the connection details that you previously used to create that uh, specific connection. So if I wanted to, I can change the port number. And once that's changed, I can hit the update profile button and that would change the connection details of that specific connection um, in real time and update it for you. As well as that, you've also got the option to hide the profile, which removes it temporarily from the Kicks view. And then you can load it back in by clicking the plus icon and clicking the profile. Or you've also got the option to completely remove it from memory by clicking the delete profile button. So as well as that, as you can see, once I've expanded the region, there's a programs folder, transactions folder, and local files folder. And they basically contain the uh, corresponding resources in that particular region. So for example, I, the region IY3B NCAF of, of WinMVS3B has 41 programs. And if I wanted to, I can right click and see the attributes for that specific resource. So for example, so, so, this, so, this, so this contains a table of all the attributes for that specific program. And then I also have the ability to search for uh, sp a particular attributes as well. So for example, I can check the status to see if it's enabled or disabled. Um, and, I've, and there's a bunch of other attributes as well uh, corresponding to that particular resource. And I can do the same thing with local transactions and local files as well. Now, when we first released the Kix extension, our, MV, our MVP was to get the new copy working. So let me switch to a little use case scenario. So if I switch to my 3270 and start a new session, so this is right now, current. Uh, it's currently connected to WinMVS3B, which is the um, same system that I had here. And if I uh, log on to apply the IY3B and CAF, which is our region, hit enter um, and then start the transaction SSC1. So if I go back to VS code, SSC1 is this transaction over here. So if I switch back again, switch back to my 3270, click enter to start the transaction. So this use case scenario, in this use case scenario, essentially you, I can request for a customer number. Uh, so for example, I can request for customer number one uh, and that gives me back all the details of that particular customer. So this is Graham. Graham's in the UK and the value that we're interested in for this simple use case scenario is the mobile phone extension number, which is plus four four since Graham's in the UK. But if we switch to customer number two, as you can see, the telephone extension is blank. Now to correct this, I would, as a Kix Cobol developer, I would need to go to the um, Cobol files, change the change the code for it, save it, submit the job, and then perform a new copy. 
So, so let's um, go through those steps in VS Code. So if I expand my data sets, uh, open up the WinMVS 3B DOSMF connection, um, I can expand the COBOL data set, but what I've, al what I've already done is I've saved the 3B ZOSMF data sets to my favorites. So if I expand the COBOL file, find the program LGI cost 01, uh, which contains the code responsible for the for changing the for changing the telephone codes. Um, and if I look here, the um, UK telephone code is hasn't been commented out, but all the others have. So for our Italian customer, um, the code's been left to blank because uh, this part of the code's been commented out. So if I uncomment that out, save it, and then submit the JCL by right-clicking and clicking Submit Job. And then if I click the this hyperlink, it takes me to the jobs view. And if I look at the code, that means the um, zeros mean that the job has been successful. And if I switch back to my 3270 and click enter, as you can see, the telephone code hasn't been updated yet. And this is because I haven't performed the new copy. Now there's two ways to perform the new copy. I could either, um, I could either leave VS Code and then go to a terminal and then perform a new copy. Um, but then this would mean exit, exiting the transaction, switching views, uh, logging in, and it would be a big mess. Um, but what I can do, what I can also do is go directly inside VS Code um, and let me just collapse the other views and then go under the kicks view, find the LGI cus one program inside my kicks connection under IY3B and CAF. Um, and once I've found it, I can either right click and click the new copy, or I can simply click the new copy icon here, which is just a little arrowhead that we have. So as you can see that updated from two to three, and if we go back to our 3270 and click enter again, as you can see, the country code for our IT custom, uh, for our Italian customer has changed to the correct, um, sorry, the telephone code has changed to the correct number. So this is a very simple example, but it essentially shows how um, some of the main actions that a Kix COBOL developer needs to perform can be performed entirely on VS Code from start to finish without having to switch to the 3270 uh, terminal. So let me switch back to the VS Code window and let me just close these up. So as I said before, um, when we first got the extension out, our um, MVP was to get the new copy working. But since then, we've had a lot of changes and we've got a lot of other functionalities as well. So for example, I can perform a phase in, um, which again performs sort of similar to a new copy. I can also enable and disable a program. So for example, I can do the disable and you can see the disable text right next to the program. You can also enable the program as well. Um, you can also apply filters as well. So for example, I can go to the programs folder, hit the filter icon, and I can create a new program filter and search for LGI star. So all the programs starting with LG. And once I've got all the programs, what I can do is um, select the first program, do a shift click uh, to select all the other programs. I can simply um, right click and perform new copy or one of the other commands, or I can click the new copy icon. And as you can see, that'll new copy all of the programs at once. And it's a similar sort of thing with transactions as well. With transactions, we've got the enable and disable. So once I disable a transaction, that the, the action will toggle to an enable. And we've got the show attribute as well. Uh, for local files, it's again similar, but we've also got the option to open a local file as well. Um, I picked one that doesn't work. So I can toggle between open and close, um, enable and disable as well. So that 
one works. And when I close it, I get the option to choose what happens in the file busy condition. So I can choose to wait, no wait, or force the action. Um, so those are the main functions I can perform to the resources. So that so those are so that's a view of what happens if we have a single region. So a connection with a single region. Now, if we want to scale, now if we want to scale that up a little bit, we've got two C here, which is a connection to KXX fifty six. And KXX fifty six is a plex this time. So as you can see, the layout is slightly different. So since it's a plex, it contains several regions. So we've got a regions folder that contains seven active regions out of the nine total regions. And we also have an all programs tree, all local transactions tree and all local files tree. So what the all local files tree contain, um, so, so, so the all programs tree contains all programs across all of these regions. And that's quite advantageous because what you can do is you can apply a filter um, for let's say, everything that starts with IX. So all programs that start with IX. And once you have that, you can perform actions across multiple, multiple programs across multiple regions all at once. Um, and that's a, a feature that a lot of users had requested to us. Um, so that's a very useful feature. You can also go directly to the regions folder and apply a filter to all resources in each of those regions, or you can also apply a regions filter. So for example, um, I can uh, search for IYCWEMI. So everything that starts with um, that prefix, Ooh, I deleted the IYCWEMI star, and that gives me um, all the regions that start with that prefix. And then once I'm done, I can hit the clear filter icon, a uh, clear filter icon, and then I can choose to clear the region filter and get back my original list. Yeah, Jeffin, I've got a question here from uh, Richard Craven. He says, uh, Zoe for kicks, I didn't see a parameter to specify resource group names. Can you tell us how that is specified for your list, for your file list, for example? Oh sure, yeah. So is this um, so is that yeah, for so, yeah, so Jeff and um so so you're um Richard, um we're not currently this is not CSD information. So this is not this these are the installed resources. So, so we're not we're, we're not listening data out the CSD. But Jeff yeah, and hey, we'll Joe. Show, sorry, hey Joe. Ezreal, this is this is a CEMT command, not a CEDA command. Yeah, so exactly right. It's not resources in the CSD itself. Yeah, thanks as well for jumping in. Richard, does that answer your question? Although Jeff is just about to show that we can do system group scoping on a Plex. Yep, That's sure. Um, I'll jump into that very quick. Uh, just after I show one more feature. Cool. So this is a Plex with um, seven regions. Um, so let's say we wanted to scale this up a little bit more. Let's say we have a very large region with uh, several regions and that's what KickCIP over here is. So it's got two, four, six, seven regions, I think, seven plexes, I think. And in each of those plexes, it has um, a ton of regions. So the first plex here has 100, 155 active regions out of the 171. Um, and one issue that we, um one issue that that could have potentially arise is um if a user requests all programs in all of those um 171 regions if they if they made a request for that it would take a significant amount of time to load fetch all the resources and also it would take a significant amount of time to scroll um vertically to uh, find a particular resource so what we did to combat that issue is when a user requests um, for particular sets of programs, uh, we've limited the amount shown to 500 at a time. Now this amount is set, um, is set by default, but in the future we will be allowing, 
we will be providing the user with an option to change the amount shown at once um, in the settings. So it's showing 500 at the moment, but if I scroll down all the way down to the end of that list, I, also, I get an option to view X more resources. And if I click that, um, the Kicks extension would go ahead and load the 275 more programs. And you can see the full list of programs, so the 775 um, programs. So essentially what I wanted to show is that the Kicks extension also handles large systems um, very well as well. Now back to the question with the um, Kicks system groups as well. So 2C Kicks uh, is, let me just close that. So 2C Kicks is connected to the um, Plex Kicks X56, and Kicks X56 has several system groups. So I can click the update um, profile button, and as well as the region name, I can also specify a system group. So a system group that I know um, off the top of my head is Baz1. So I can click the update profile, and that creates, uh, I'll show you now, actually. So that creates a, um, that fetches all the information from a system group called Baz1, and Baz1 contains um, two out of the three regions. And one thing you might notice is that the icon's slightly different as well. Um, so that's the icon for a Plex, that's the icon for a uh, system group as well. And similarly, you can load in several I guess you can make several connections to several system groups um, and access them all at the same time as well, which is a really useful feature. So we have Baz1 here. Let me just um, let me just hide these actually, just to make the view just to make it easy to view. So we've got Baz1 here. Baz1 has two out of three regions. Baz2 has one more region, I think. So it's got three out of four. Baz3 has one more than Baz2, it's got four out of five. And I can, um, I guess, simultaneously access resources. So I can access resources um, from Baz1, perform an action on it, and also load up a resource from Baz2 as well, and then perform uh, a, an action on another item, the, like straight after as well. So you've got the ability to make several connections and load them all up at the same time. So, I th I th so those are the main features that I wanted to go over for the Kicks extension. And the main point I want to get across is that, um, again, it allows a Kicks Cobalt developer to do, every, do uh, most of their tasks entirely on Visual Studio Code from start to finish without having to switch to a terminal window. In terms of future work, if I switch back to my PowerPoint, I put it from current slide. So what's next? So, so Zoe is preparing for its V2 release, uh, which makes use of um, what's called team configuration files. Uh, and it essentially allows you to uh, share um, share connection details um, to to team members. Um, and there's a lot of development going on there within Zoe, and we're working on the Kicks extension to make it uh, compliant with all the V2 changes. We're also working closely with uh, with the Open Mainframe Project Cobol programming course. And the course is essentially an initiative under um, OMP, the Open Mainframe Project, uh, that, and it offers introductory level COBOL material using tools such as Zoe Explorer. And we want to try and get the Zoe Explorer for IBM Kicks in there as well. We're also in the future looking to add more resources. So aside from the programs, local transactions and local files, um, resources that we have. We also want to add in other resources as well, such as web services, um, 
DB2 transactions and so on. And if anyone does have any suggestions or advice on what resources that they would like, um, please, free, please feel free to either post it on the chat or I'll let you know how to contact us in the next slide as well. We, we are also thinking about um, allowing, uh, allowing a Java developer to use. So we're thinking about changing the extension to allow to cater for a Java developer persona, because right now it's um, very orientated at, at, around a Kix COBOL developer. So that could also be something that we might look into in the future. So to stay in to stay in touch with us, um, there's there's two main ways to get in contact with us. Either you could go to our GitHub repository at Zoe slash VS Code extension for Kicks and raise a new issue. We'd love any sort of feedback, any sort of comments that you have, um, or another way you could contact us is by going to the Zoe Explorer Slack channel on the open mainframe project workspace on Slack and posting a, a message on there and we'll be more than happy to um, more than happy to respond to any queries or feedback that you have. And if you wanted to get started on this and wanted to uh, find more documentation on this, you could go straight to the zoe.org website, go to the docs, docs tab, um, go to use, um, and under the Zoe Explorer extensions, there's the documentation for Zoe Explorer for IBM Kicks extension. And that's got all the features that I just went over in today's presentation. And, uh, and yeah, this is the GitHub repository as well um, that I showed in the presentation. But yeah, I, th I think that's it from me. Does anyone have any questions? Or, is, or Joe, do you have anything else to add? This is Tim Andler from Wells Fargo. I got a question about how does the default warn count fit into the limit that you, I know you said you picked kind of 500, but um, maybe could that tie into the default warn, warn count, the, the WUI parameter? Yeah, so, so if the default warning count is set, which is server side, then that is going to be an upper limit. That will throttle the upper limit. So it won't go above that upper limit of default warning count. The 500 okay. that Jeff in showed is, so um, because it's a tree and not a table, the Kix Explorer has a table. Um, if you think of the Kix Explorer, it doesn't really matter if you get 2000 transactions, right? Because it doesn't actually obscure anything other than the transaction pane or the program pane. Because we've got a tree on the left, we felt because most people set the default warning count to be 2,000, I think. We thought that if you plussed it and you just got 2,000, you would just trip over yourself. So for example, if Jeff had set that to 5,000 and the default warning count returned 2,000, it would have, banked, it would have uh, gated at 2,000 because that would have been the lower of the two. Um, does that answer your question? The, 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 the two complement one another? Yes, yeah, I think so. And there's no way to surpass the default warning count. Is that what I so heard? There is, we can, on the REST API request, we could issue something and the Kix Explorer lets you do this. The VS right, right. comes up yep. with a pop-up that said, you know what, you know what, you, you, know, you put a, a speed sign, but I'm just going to drive straight through it. If you think that's interesting, we could do that. Would you like us to do that? I mean, we'd, we'd well, I, coming from using the Explorer before you were able to surpass that and then after it, it sometimes it's hard to, you know, one, you want that default warrant count to, to maybe stop other people from from being able to surpass that but but every once in a while on the system side you know you might really need to go after that number and it you know may, let's say 2001 right and uh, that hard limit was was something that was an issue prior to the explorer being able to it let was, you surpass yeah. that I mean one thing that's different about this in the Kix Explorer so I've actually worked on the Kix Explorer in a previous life is that if you look at what Jeffrey was showing there, he was showing like three or four or something, even five or six Kix CMCI connections all lined up above one another, right? Now, 
towards the end, those were all going against the same kicksplex, right, with different groups like Baz One, Baz Two, and Baz Three. So I think the scenario when we started talk, started talking to developers, they were saying the problem with the case explorer is it kind of shows you everything, and you then have to throttle down what you don't want. Whereas what we want to do is have it so that you can actually have different connections. So on your connection, you could basically say, you know, I really just want to work with these programs and these transactions and these files and these web services that just represent the kind of change ticket that I'm working on as a developer. So you almost want all of that stuff to be front loaded in the actual profile that defines the connection. I, I guess that assumes that developers have access to create system groups? Well, yeah, so developers don't, and we deliberately didn't put the create system group in there because we know they won't. Gotcha, we okay. Hope, yeah, um, and we haven't even got CSD access in there for the very much the same reason. You're right, it depends on the discipline of the shop as to whether they would create the system groups, but you're right, but you're right. Sometimes people just want to punch out, you know, programs and, and have it filtered because they've got naming conventions or something. But, over, but running through the red light of the default warning count is a good, yeah, we should add that as a feature. Yeah, good call. Okay, I've got a couple of questions that are in the chat. So this one's from Kuldeep uh, Pariah. He says, can we execute Kick's transaction also using Zoe? Uh, so, so what Jeffin did there, where he had to switch, he, he SSC1 was a 3270 terminal. So that was a Kix program with a BMS map. Currently, no, we don't have. <clears throat> so Zoe does have a component that we didn't talk about today, which is a, a, called the Zoe desktop, which is where you actually get a free, fairly decent functioning 3270 emulator. Um, so yes, if you, and you can use that to execute your transaction. But the problem with just saying, I want to start a transaction is the second that that transaction opens a data stream and is like, you know, has a BMS map, we just, we wouldn't know what to do, how to render it. Um, I mean, but it, I don't know, Israel, do you want to jump? I just can't think. Yeah, I mean, keep, keep in mind that uh, not all development today is done by a 3270. If the application is 3270 based, then the easiest way to test it is to open a 3270 and run it, right? Because whoever the developer is needs access via 3270 and is going to be able to run it that way. The advantage of this is there's other development in Kicks. There are programs that you run via web calls, right? Some people have HTML screens, some people connect mm -hmm. to a server. And for all of those, you certainly don't need to log into a 3270 to run it, right? So, you know, if the application doesn't require a 3270, then you won't require one either. If the application requires a 3270 for testing, then, then you just need a 3270. But all the development work can be done through VS Code. There's no reason for you to log on to a 3270 to, you know, write the code, compile the program or new copy it, right? So. You know, one of the nice things was is he could actually just literally switch and test very quickly. Right, yeah. Yeah, thanks. And you actually right. So one of the next scenarios we want to tackle for the for the COBOL is rather than the COBOL having a 3270 BMS map, is that's a web service? And if that's the case, you would test that issuing some sort of REST API. And we would try and go back to the VS Code market. Like we, you know, we would find a way to basically get that. Um, get some test harness. And we've been looking at various sort of REST client plugins that would let you do that. Yeah, so that's what, it's a long answer to a question saying yes and no, um, which is if it's a 3270 based transaction, that's not really within our scope to try and do in VS Code. But if it's a web service one, yeah, there's some fun plugins out there that can let you do that. Okay, great. There's one other question about uh, doing Python, but you've answered that. Uh... So that's all the questions we've got at the moment. If anyone else has got any questions, they can email me. My email address will be on screen in a minute and I'll pass them on to uh, uh, Jeffin and Joe to uh, get an answer for you. Oh, Nick Harris is saying thanks, guys. So uh, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do next. So thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, Joe and Jeffin, because uh, we're a virtual user group, Please assume that we're giving you a virtual round of applause now. Thanks.
<laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm sorry I overran. It was me at the start. I, I kind of fumbled a bit. But yeah, please stay in touch. It's open source, right? This is not like you have to raise an IBM RFE and wait ages for it to get fixed, right? You can raise an issue and, you know, Jeff could be fixing it within two days, right? We could be in a WebEx with you the day afterwards. And we really love that engagement. So, so please, don't be a stranger, yeah? That's great. Yeah, well, that's brilliant. So, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed that presentation. Really interesting. I'm going to move on quickly. I've got a couple of slides. I'll do them as quickly as I can because um, I haven't got any kicks news to share with you. And there's only one uh, article that I've seen, which is on the uh, IBM Z and Linux One community area, uh, which is that um, uh, Kix TS for ZOS 5.6 has been updated in January. Well, I'm hoping you all knew that anyway. Feedback requests, if you've got anything to say about today's session. Um, also, there's my email address. So if you do have any questions for the guys, just email me, I'll pass them on. As Joe promises, that there'll be action within two days. So uh, by Friday, you'll have a response. <laughs> um, so coming soon, what have we got? Next time, 10th of May, we've got Robert Barnes, CEO of Jazz Software. He's going to be talking about Kix Web Services and bridging two worlds. And then on the 12th of July, we've got Stuart Francis, again from IBM, and he's going to be looking at developing and modernizing Kix applications with Ansible. So I imagine that's going to be uh, really interesting as well for looking at what's happening in the future. Okay, yes, we're all over social media. Our hashtag is virtual CICS. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. LinkedIn don't do vanity URLs, so that's why it's got a long number at the back. Um, also, can I just mention, we do have a, a YouTube channel, but YouTube needs to have 100 subscribers before you can have a vanity URL for that. So at the moment, We've got an incredibly long one, uh, which is where you link to find recordings of our sessions. So if you could subscribe to that, then I'll be able to get a nice, uh, nice looking URL for it. Um, well, that's it for this meeting, the virtual Kicks user group. Can I thank you all for attending? Uh, thanks to Hostbridge Technology and Rocket Software for sponsoring our user group. And I'd particularly like to thank Joe Winchester and Jeff in Sibby for their presentation today. So that's it. Thank you all very much for joining the meeting and hopefully see you all on the 10th of May. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>